whoever throws water forward will walk on wet ground. Mm. That is, if you do good, you'll reap the rewards of it. And then Fela, who parents' house where I grew up, um, he said he, he has this song. <laughs> Omiolotao, water, you don't get any. And the song says, if you want to bake, you need water. If you want to cook, you need water. Um, if, some, if something, if your head is hot, <laughs> water is the, the, the thing that cools it down. Um, if, when children are growing up, they need water. Um, if Water kills your child. You still you need water. Um, if uh, there's nothing about black people, this is black men, because Fela is a little misogynist. <laughs> but his mother is a feminist. You know, his mother was a feminist of record and of weight. So for him, water people flow. And it shows us that the Yorubas and many African communities who have similar sayings get it. Although they did not know Western science when this saying came about, they knew then when this saying originated and know now that we human beings are water. Western science confirms it by telling us that we are mostly water in our constitution, in our makeup. We show that we are water when we move from one place to another when we develop relationships, when we help one another. We do it when we just are. Then invoking the second proverb I gave, that anybody that is so I whoever throws water forward will walk on wet ground. If you do good, you'll reap the rewards of it. This also evokes the values that you have hold dear. The ideals that we must, as human beings, do good. This is the notion that whatever goes around essentially comes around. Then when Fela said, oh, you lot out, what are you not getting? He meant to tell us that what is such a necessity that no one can possibly get it. One could also interpret the Fela lyrics as meaning that water is an inevitable part of life. We cannot do without it. Until humanity decides to consciously change things, women worldwide, are primarily responsible for ensuring that family well-being is served. In Africa, a lot of the work that it takes to nurture families devolves on women, finding water, fetching it, using it, and making sure that there's enough for the needs of the family are all tasks that women take on, mostly assisted by the children in their families and communities, and most families and communities actually impose this work on grown children. UN estimates tell us by, that by 2000, there were 16 million international migrants out of the continents, continent of Africa, 796 million people. This was an increase from 9.4 million um, out of 277 million Africans in 1960. These are population movements within the continent alone. So 16 million of us Africans are mobile. And these are incomplete statistics because the people who gathered it from the United Nations Population Division also tell us that they don't have the figures from 19 countries. And it's also a woeful undercount because I think this is one of the things that really bothers me. Uh, African governments have not been very good in comparison to, to the other major areas of the developing world, Africa has had more than double the number of international migrants. Um, okay. So, the share of Africa in terms of the worldwide number of international uh, migrants, however, has been decreasing steadily since 1980. And in 1980, the figures that they gave is that it's about 14% of Africans, uh, of all populations moving. And now we have 11% in 1990 and about 9% in 2000. That's up as the uh, a percentage of the total migrations in the world. Okay. So in the last 20 years, Africa's share of the world migrant population has been um, decreasing. 
but we shouldn't kind of be very comfortable about this. There are a lot of other statistics that um, I have. I only have 10 copies of this. If people are interested, they can look at it. I didn't collect it. Uh, the Migration Policy Institute did, and they did this from UN figures. So I have those figures here that show you the trends from um, 1960, I don't know, from 1990 to um, 2000. So people can take some if they want. Um, and I say human, move, human beings move around for many reasons. Economic crisis, driving the need to attain a better life is one reason why people move. Some such migration is caused by lack of economic opportunities. Some of the migrations are caused by environmental degradation and climate change, and some by food insecurity, some by the need to find a safe haven from war, from persecution, and from crisis. The United Nations Economic Com um, Commission for Africa agrees on this. And today, I think that all these reasons can be classed under the heading of um, globalization, which is moving people from less to more affluent, less secure to more secure areas in the world. And um, many of those effects are more glaring today. But the processes have been with us for a very long time. We have just decided to begin to notice them more intensively and to focus on these effects more um, systematically. In testament to the long-standing nature of migration as a human phenomenon, we can find many illustrative examples in the African continent. And I started off as a student of history, and we talked about great migrations in the African continent that occurred as a result of innovations that human beings um, made in their lives in, in kind of trying to relate better to the environment. So during the Iron Age, people moved. Um, and during the subsequent ages of innovation in human history, I will not also concentrate on this. Um, but a lot of movements occurred when wars of conquest were waged by expansionist states, forcing the people who um, were determined to escape this crisis that they set in motion to flee in search of refuge. We are going to ask what does this have to do with women water and migration? A lot. And I'm going to get to that. There was also the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and the slave, the trading slaves that went via the Indian Ocean on the eastern part of Africa, and the one that went through the Sahara. Some scholars call those forced migrations. I do not like this phrase, forced migrations, to describe the enslavement of people and their removal from their homes, their loved ones, and even the continent to feed the more the mouth, the big mouth of commerce. Men, women, and children were enslaved, and we should use those words to capture the genocide that occurred as a result of these movements, not forced migrations, because it kind of um, it in a way that's not necessary. I'm not going to focus on the slavery post movement of African peoples, however, but I'm going to look at contemporary diasporization and the migrations that I recalled before as, pro as caused by prolonged economic crisis, drought, desertification, and the environmental degradation that these and many other phenomena have caused in the African continent. According to experts like Adirante Adekupodri, who focuses on migrations within the African continent, increasingly African migration is feminized. That is, more women are moving than men. And um, an expert from the UN population um, gathering, I mean, population focused um, um, institution agrees. Her name is Slotnik. In the past, men moved first, their spouses followed, they said. Today, women are not only moving, many are leaving their husbands and children at home and becoming the primary breadwinners for their families when they move outside the continent. Some of these movements are very disturbing because they have to do with the trafficking of people 
um, who are looking for alternative um, livelihood strategies for their families. I'm not, I'm also not going to concentrate on that, but it's important that we mention that this is part of the movements that women are making out of desperation. Um, okay, so Zlotnik tells us that female international migration within the, uh, the continent of Africa was lower in the other, uh, than in the other world regions in 1960, but that by 2000, it constituted about 46.7% of the 16 million migrants in the continent. This is a figure that outpaced Asia's 46% and Latin America and the Caribbean's 45%. There are other areas of the world that have, have over 50% female migration, but Africa is closely uh, following those in its 46.7% of total migration within the continent figure. Slotnik also tells us that statistics demonstrate that increases in the female migration look at these movements. There are also regional differences as a result of deliberate government policy. So that you see that um, in the Southern Africa region, 30% of the population movements were um, women in 1960, 42% in 2000. West Africa has the highest. 40 to 41, um, 41 to 42 percent in 1960 and 48% in 2000. North Africa, by comparison, experienced a decline from 49.5% in 1960 to approximately 43% in 2000. These are UN figures uh, based on the fact that they are also saying that they don't have complete information from about 19 countries. Um, Okay, so I see many of these movements as part of the way in which the operation of the capitalist economy that we have in the world today compels rural and urban migration such that people who were left behind in rural communities are predominantly women, children, the elderly, the sick, and the disabled. And those who are unable or unwilling to do the available linear jobs that Africans are recruited for in the world economy. While such migrations can be found throughout the African continent, Southern Africa stands as a significant example of this phenomenon, both historically and contemporarily. The mining and industrial sectors in South Africa, in, well, Southern Africa, mainly located in, the Southern Af in South Africa itself, use many of the rural areas of South Africa and Southern Africa as labor reserves for the mines and industries in South Africa. Other demands for labor come from the agricultural sector and even the household economy. So due to deliberate state policy under apartheid, black, black African populations in South Africa have historically been pushed to the most marginal lands. The result is intractable unemployment, that is, an unemployment that doesn't seem to have any solution, as well as the extreme impoverishment of the heavily populated rural areas that become virtually denuded of men for given periods of the year due to circular migration. As a result, and you know, what we are saying on South Africa, you can also observe in other African regions, because West Africa, as I said, is an, is an area where you have a lot of these population movements as well. And apart from the, pop, from the movement of mature women, you also have movement of children who are absorbed into household economies to be housemaids and houseboys, and sometimes to be agricultural laborers. Now, um, I've been talking so much about migration. How about water? When you have impoverishment that is a result of putting off of leaving people in rural populations where there are few jobs and where the resources might be um, overstretched as a result of um, intensive settlements, you also have a lot of instability that of course, the case that I am focusing on in Southern Africa shows that the economy of these rural areas become transformed sometimes from an agrarian one that um, 
is based on subsistence because the land that is available is not enough for subsistence. And so the, the, there's a transformation to capitalist production, but that kind of capitalist production is the most um, extreme and people are not able to meet their subsistence needs and they don't have enough economic resources to purchase the things that they need. And then water, potable water that is clean and healthy water is less available and women must do water purification. One of the things they noticed in one of the areas that um, some scholars focused upon in South, in South Africa is that you have increased amount of food insecurity. So there's insufficient food um, for families. There's a lack of potable water. And there's increased burdens on women and young children who have to expend more energy to locate and fetch water and also purify water for their communities. In this Southern African community of about 750, it's a district, about 750,000 people, um, Women have to transport 25 gallon drums of water in wheelbarrows. Or those who cannot afford to do this have to carry the water on their heads in um, big containers and walk very long distances uh, because, and this water is not potable. So when they get into their homes, they have to boil, they have to filter, and anything that they can do to make this water um, you know, usable for their families in a way that doesn't hurt them. Exclusively women, and then I say girls, who are being groomed to take their, pro uh, their positions as providers of free, unremunerated labor on behalf of their families have to do most of this work. High levels of infant mortality due to diarrhea, due to kwashioko, and HIV AIDS that doesn't have anything to do with water, you know, um, is some of the stuff that happens to these families. There are also other causes, but the fact that a lot of the deaths are caused by diarrhea means that waterborne ailments, waterborne diseases, are very serious public health issues in this community of 750,000 people. And what they're saying here in Southern Africa applies to West Africa, applies to my country, Nigeria. We tend to also see this as a rural problem. I grew up in Lagos. Lagos is one of the most overcrowded mega cities in the world and it has a tremendous water problem because if you live in Lagos you have to buy water or you have to make a borehole if your house belongs to you um, and when you make a borehole then you have to become a water purification agency um, so that the water is usable. But many families in water, I mean in Lagos, um, if they're affluent, if they're middle class and upper, they would buy water from these water merchants that transport water in, um, in, to, to their homes in um, tankers. And then they would have their own individual water tanks to which this water is put, and then they have to do the purification. This consumes a whole lot of resources it consumes a whole lot of energy and time of um, women. And uh, my sisters, I have three sisters still living in Lagos, they would put these big jerry cans in their trunks and they would fetch water, maybe from their workplaces, and transport this water home. They have to carry the water and put it in places where they can secure it so that people don't steal it. And all kinds of contortions <laughs> that women have to go through even as they are professionals, you know, in their jobs, it consumes a great deal of time. So the idea that these are issues just for rural women is not true. In Nigeria, many urban women have to deal with water problems. And, you know, this problem impacts on both rural and urban women because if we have growing desertification, if the Sahel is extending, if the Sahara is extending, then it means that we're going to deal with more and more water insecurity issues in the continent. It's affecting people who are highly mobile, like people who are um, 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 nomadic, because when the nomadic populations don't have enough water for their, um, for their 
for their own use and for the use of the animals that they, they raise that are a, an intricate part of how they sustain their communities. They're going to encroach on land that you know, more settled populations have. And you have these causing problems of conflict between people who say, you know, these are newcomers. Never mind the fact that some of these movements of the nomadic people have happened, you know, for millennia, you know. Uh, and people who are more settled who feel that this land belongs to them and the water on the land they must use, they're having conflicts. African governments have not responded either appropriately or adequately to many of these challenges. And so you have eruptions that of violence that occur uh, in these communities that <coughs> cause a lot of devastation to lives, to property, and to the well-being of people. So issues of how to deal with environmental degradation, with uh, people's security of access to clean water and to reliable water supplies are issues that tie all communities in Africa together, whether they are rural or urban. Now, for rural populations, because of the wanton neglect that has occurred as a result of colonial policy that continued today at the ball, and we need to again refocus attention to the crucial um, nature of water and the need to access it reliably as one of the most important issues that the African continent faces today. I think it's atrocious that there are people who are profiting by selling water. And it's also causing other environmental problems. Because for example, you have some of these um, commercial concerns that either bottle water or put water in plastic disposable plastic containers that people, and um, they're not um, bottles, they're like uh, the plastic, made, made from plastic sachets. They have started, these sachets have now become part of the, you know, detritus that's floating around uh, uh, many African communities. And this is, you know, this plastic doesn't degrade. So, and we don't deal with it, you know, it's called pure water. <laughs> you know, so we feel that we have made a breakthrough. And this is a livelihood strategy for some women too, and men. And it's a good thing that people are making money, but we need to think about how we are going to recycle if this is how we want to go. But I don't think that this is a sustainable strategy if we want to solve the problem of access to clean water in the continent. And we need to think about it not just as government working top down or international organization that wants to go and help the Africans again, but we need to bring together local communities, especially women, to figure out how we are going to solve the water problem. And then again, I have to say that this profiting from water is something that came about with the structural adjustment um, programs that came to solve African indebtedness. Instead, what I see is creating opportunities for some to profit and other people to use more of their bigger resources to access clean water. Okay, so I think the problem of water remains a challenge for us and we must think about this as something that um, links the rural and urban communities together. I think due to the gendering of society in a manner that domestic work and the work of raising children, caring for the sick, all of these things need water. Uh, because this work devolves exclusively on women, or more heavily on women, the burden and challenges of access to water, the work of purifying the water, and I know I'm repeating myself, and stretching sometimes very meager family resources to purchase water because it falls on, on women exclusively, we have to think of this as a problem, not just for the women who are doing this because they have to, but a problem that affects each and every one of us. Men and women, I have five minutes. Wow. Okay. Some of 
these problems of migration affect people who we have decided to classify as refugees? Um, okay. The number of refugees in the continent of Africa has ex escalated progressively from 79,000 people in 1960 to 6.4 million people in 1995. Again, remember, it's an undercount. Um, because in the 1990s, some conflicts that occurred in the continent were resolved successfully. Um, refugee numbers were lowered momentarily. But then we had other wars that emerged at the same time. And so um, we have more increases. Now, the numbers of the people classified as refugees have actually diminished con you know, considering the size, the increase in the population in Africa. But some of the diminution, some of the lower numbers, is also because African governments are refusing to classify people as refugees. They say they don't have any money. And you know, some of this is genuine. But a lot of money is also wasted on other things. So I'll just say that. So African countries are now reporting that they only have 3.6 million refugees in 2000. This is a 44% reduction from 1995. This is fake, okay? Because the refugees exist, but people don't want to classify them as such. Because if you classify them as such, you have to take care of them. So local communities, some of them who are really struggling with nitty gritty livelihood issues, are also having to help informally to take care of refugees that governments are not classifying as such so that they don't have to bear financial responsibility. So I'm saying that we shouldn't celebrate such reductions and that Africa still has high percentages, they're just hidden. Um, okay. I'm going to move. I want us to capture the essence of our discussions this morning as evolving, involving what scholars have couched as the impact of climate change on development and human welfare, particularly in developing countries. All of, you know, um, all of us are aware that we've had sudden, inexplicable, and severe weather um, swings back and forth. You know, sometimes it's hot when, it's, when we expect it to be cold. Snow doesn't fall when we expect it. The ice caps are disappearing. There's um, also a lot of threats that this is contributing in terms of flooding, in terms of some communities actually thinking that they're going to be buried by water. Um, so many people's way of life, their survival, their communities are being threatened in strange and inexplicable ways that is causing a lot of threat to their lives and to their well-being. These extreme weather events, as some scholars call it, is, um, involves storms, floods, and hurricanes. So where there's insufficient water in some situations, we have water, water everywhere for some people and not a drop to drink. So you might have you know, massive amounts of water and you still don't have the capacity to use that water in a way that sustains life. Instead, it becomes a real threat and danger to communities. There are also many um, gradual and environmental changes. There's the drought that comes from des desertification. And in West Africa, since we are very close to the Sahara, and we are, many of our countries are in the Sahel, we have these threats that's kind of waiting to pounce on us. Many people are suffering from the effects in very real ways. So we have to think of how to balance these issues. The fact that some people have too much, the fact that some people have too little, and how do we help every one of us? I think we have to step in and help ourselves. First of all, we don't pay too much attention to government well. I'm out of time, we put pressure on governments. We have to organize, not agonize. Uh, we have to put pressure on government. So I want to um, 
take the end of my presentation as the beginning. I want to echo not myself, but the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in asking that we consider these questions that are embedded in the climate migration nexus, that is the connection between climate and migration. That climate and migration, the relationship that it has, has significant implications for human vulnerabilities. Migration is an adaptive mechanism. People take these measures sometimes as emergency measures uh, because they want to vary on healthy ways. And these pressures are of considerable threat to their lives, to their life, livelihood, and to their well-being. Also, these pressures uh, affect social and economic structures, including gender relationships. Um, also, we have to think of what kind of community resources do we have that enable us to cope with change, with these changes. What kind of pre-existing migration patterns do we have and how do they impact on gender relations? Um, how does climate change impact on populations? We've learned a lot and we can also learn more by drawing on the knowledge of ordinary people and the solutions that they've made. So in, in kind of drawing on this knowledge basis, we can make policy recommendations, and I could tell you a lot about that, but I won't. Um, there's need for multilateral cooperation. <coughs> International organizations need to start foregrounding the needs of ordinary people and not feathering their own nest by paying all these people that really don't produce much in terms of real changes that people feel that make them experience well-being in their lives. Um, I also think that a lot of policies need to be thrown out because they're not working. Um, I think that people must be considered experts in terms of the, you know, the, the nitty gritty of what they feel, the ways in which they have solved problems, and we have to work with them to make sustainable um, solutions. I think my colleagues will be talking about some of those solutions. I am. <laughs> but it's jet lag that caused it. Because <laughs> I just came from Nigeria two days ago. Well, um, Professor Okome has stolen half of my paper. Uh, so I have to talk. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm actually going to uh, focus in on Ghana as a case study. Uh, looking at the water uh, and women issues in Africa. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about women and how quickly some of the factors that uh, influence women's lives, food security issues, livelihood issues, and, and how these are also linked to issues of water, disaster, and climatic change that shape their mi migration patterns and decisions. And I will end then with talking a little bit specifically about what we're doing at WaterAid in Ghana to address some of these issues, how we are engaging government to some degree, uh, some of the programs that we're trying to put in place, as well as how we're trying to work with other uh, organizations to um, achieve uh, Millennium Development Goals 1, 3, and for us, 7, which is in looking at environment issues where the, the wash agenda, water sanitation, and hygiene agenda is embedded. So um, to start out with, um, we know that in, in West Africa, as uh, Professor O'Connor said, people move a lot. Um, nomadic peoples and traders move throughout uh, West Africa through some very um, significant trade routes. Um, starting in the, from the 4th century, we had the Kingdom of Ghana, uh, also known as Wagadugu, which arose in the Niger, Niger River Valley. Um, the capital of that empire was, was also called Ghana, not, not the geopolitical space that we're talking about, that's today's Ghana. But ancient Ghana um, allowed, it, um, controlled a lot of the, the, the spaces and, and trading uh, areas between northern and southern Africa until the emergence of the uh, Kingdom of Mali. 
So early patterns of migration in Africa reflect the movement of people across the continent seeking not only to trade and pursue livelihoods, but also, as was mentioned, to escape war, occupation, slavery from Arab and Arabs in the 17th, 7th century and then later Europeans uh, in the 19th century. So due to its central location, these migration routes have been changed by the colonial experience and the boundaries that now exist that regulate people's movement. Um, and structures like ECOWAS, which have uh, been set up and that are supposed to be promoting um, trade and movement of people in, in West Africa have done some something to facilitate it, but not uh, much. Um, at any rate, we know that now in, in West Africa, uh, the migration patterns are characterized by the increasing um, rural to urban migration trend as modern cities in the new territory, <coughs> territorial state of Ghana exists, where we have cities such as Accra, Kumasi, uh, Tamale, and other areas have emerged to be uh, major uh, magnet areas for not only traders, but also young migrants, young uh, males and females who are moving uh, from the rural areas seeking uh, work and livelihoods and educational opportunities among other things. So, you can't hear me. That's can better. That's better. Oh. Do I need to hold okay. <laughs> All right. Um, when we look at the uh, patterns of migration and demographic change, we see that in Ghana in particular, there's been uh, dramatic changes in utility rates, um, population growth rates have declined, um, and um, death rates. Um, all of this has led to some of the classification of Ghana as being uh, last year it was classified as a middle middle income country. Okay. Um, but despite that, uh, Ghana uh, still and many people there still remain relatively poor uh, in comparisons to um, other parts of the world. Ghana, as we know, is uh, touted as a nation that has over the past been a good IMF uh, pupil and has done well in terms of achieving many social indicators of development. It also draws attention as it remains one of the few countries in, in Africa and West Africa that has avoided long, large scale conflicts since independence in 1957. But despite uh, these um, um, uh, accolades, the IMF and uh, World Bank structural adjustment processes um, have have shaped the Ghanaian economy, and um, you know there are many scholars who have critiques of structural adjustment and whether or not it has benefited the majority of people in Ghana, and that at a micro uh, that, that some of the indicators have been uh, pretty much measured at the macro level while not looking at micro level uh, measures of, of people's um, material well-being. Um, they also argue that the impact of structural adjustment programs in Ghana on the poor and vulnerable groups in both rural and urban areas has uh, been disturbing, uh, both pro and con in terms of structural adjustment. Uh, so when we talk about uh, water uh, migration, uh, and um, gender issues in Ghana, there are several concepts that are contested. Of course, gender is always one um, that is contested. Issues around integrated wash, and uh, water sanitation and hygiene, the informal sector, uh, rural urban migration, urbanization, all of these concepts have provided lens through which we have to look at what is happening in Ghana in terms of um, migration and people's access to water sanitation and hygiene. But nevertheless, uh, there has been this rapid urbanization, and so people have been moving for one reason or another. And what we find and the work that we do with WaterAid, including in um, 
urban areas is to work with communities to try to provide water, sanitation, and hygiene services in many of the urban slums that are uh, there. So a lot of times when people come to Ghana, they go on their nice tours, but they don't oftentimes make it to some of the urban slum areas and communities that exist, and they are there in all of the major cities. So the implications for addressing rural women's migration, poverty status, and wash needs are also um, essential to highlight because we need to find ways, whether the women are in rural or urban areas, to ensure that government provides um, the access to safe, clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, as is known, many of the women and men, particularly from northern Ghana, migrate to the southern part of the country only to find themselves settling in these urban slum areas that I mentioned. And the women and children um, are engaged in um, petty street, uh, street trading and they live uh, often in extremely hazardous um, places and environmentally unsafe and unsanitized areas. Ghana, like most of Africa, is still predominantly rural um, but as stated above, it is, it is urbanizing uh, very fast. As urbanization proceeds in Africa, the city and the countryside become differentiated in many ways, and understanding the migration pattern between these two areas becomes increasingly important. The study of sex differences in migration has emerged as a topic of growing interest among researchers over the past two decades. Yet, as Reed and others know, few of these studies have focused on migration within national boundaries, and fewer still have examined moves by both men and women across the lifespan or life course. So when we talk about migration, um, oftentimes people give you a, a picture, a snapshot of what people's lives are at a point in time when in fact people's movements and migration patterns have um, sometimes been over generations, uh, even within families, and people who are, the young people who are now migrating and moving, you can talk to them and find out that they've moved around, you know, for many years. Um, so they have different experiences at each point in time in their life. So this is very important also to look at when we talk about uh, migration, looking at people's uh, life histories around that issue. So much of the uh, existing research on migration in less developed countries also has focused on this rural urban migration and urbanization. But internal migration includes more than movement from rural to urban areas. Recently, more attention has been paid to other types of mi migration from rural to rural areas, from urban to urban areas, and then the urban to rural areas. So the degree of urbanness also becomes an issue because um, you know, there, there are no longer strictly urban and rural areas. We have very urban and other concepts uh, and locations that are now there. And um, regardless of where people find themselves, um, our work uh, and water aid is to um, provide water, uh, sanitation, and hygiene um, wherever uh, the, the poorest and most marginalized are located. So another concept that's important here is the concept of step migration, or the sequence of moves from smaller communities to larger 